Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I'm home right now. This is not the typical place for me to lecture. Uh, but we recognize that we didn't have a video for this chapter, and I wanted to create one for all of you, um, your instructor. We'll go over Introduction to Trail Guide to the Body, uh, but this could be supplemental material for you in case you just want to hear it from a different instructor. Um, or you want to review it, or you learn best by hearing things over and over again. Repetition is is studying, and retention is learning. So, I want to introduce to you what happens to be the Massage Therapist Bible. And it's it's the book that when you go to work at a massage place, I don't care if it's a spa or a chiropractic office or whatever, um, it is very likely if there is a lounge there and there are other massage therapists sitting there that somebody will have a trail guide to the body with them. Sometimes you'll see them feverishly looking up some muscle because they didn't learn it well in anatomy class. That will not be you guys because you will graduate from Gateway and you will learn all your anatomy. And you won't have to rush out of the room or look silly when a client talks to you about a certain muscle that you're not familiar with. Uh, but anyway, you'll see these books. You'll see these books all over the place. What we're going to do today is just an introduction to how to use the book. So it's going to feel a little bit like I'm jumping around and giving you a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But in the beginning of this entire massage course, which we're still very much in the beginning, you know, we're on day six, um, we need to give you a whole smattering of of information to create a lattice, a framework for us to build other information on. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, but I'm very excited. I, I love Trail Guide to the Body. I think it's a phenomenal book. And um, anatomy that leads to um, physiology that then leads to kinesiology is, is really what we're all here about. We want to learn anatomy, what the parts are and what they're named, physiology, what they do, and kinesiology, in the case of muscles, the actions that come from, from the muscular anatomy we learn. So there's a real progression there. And kinesiology, the study of movement, also, believe it or not, is the study of standing and structure and sitting, sitting because Kinesiology allows me to not only understand how I'm doing this stuff with my hands, but it also allows me how to understand how I have posture or poor posture or whatever the case may be. And so that's where we're headed. But we have to start with some kind of foundation, and that is the introduction to trail guide to the body. So let's go through. Um, this book places heavy emphasis on bony landmarks. In fact, the book is named Trail Guide to the Body because they're expecting you to follow the trail of bony landmarks. And what are bony landmarks? They are places where bone can be felt through my skin. So you've got thousands of them, right? My knuckles are bony landmarks. They are joints where two bones come together and you can feel them through the skin, right? Um, we would not consider my bicep right in the middle to be a bony landmark because you can't really feel the bone very easily underneath it. But but my elbow, the sides of my elbow, there's these little things called, called epicondyles there. We'll learn about that later. Um, those are all bony landmarks. And we use bony landmarks to figure out where we are in the body. And that might sound like I know where I'm at in the body. I know I'm on the forearm. But actually, it's very hard finding muscles. Even though they're attached at both ends, in what we call an origin and insertion that we'll get to in just a slide or two, even though that's true, they move around quite a bit. In fact, in front of you, you see a picture of a scapula here. And scapulas on your body by design move around quite a bit. And so if you can't find the bony landmark of the scapula, it's very hard to find the muscles that attach to it. Because my scapula can actually go way, way high up. It can go really far down which we would call elevating and depressing, it can also roll around my rib cage. That's actually my scapula coming forward in what we call a protraction or an abduction, and we'll explain that all, not in today's lecture, that's tomorrow. 
but it can move way far forward. It can also come all the way back to my spine in a retraction or an adduction. And it can also, by the way, um, elevate, I'm sorry, rotate up and rotate down. So it can actually twist too. And it's actually quite hard finding somebody's scapula sometimes. And there are muscles that attach to it. And if the scapula moves up and those muscles are attached to it, they move up with it too. And so they're very hard to find as well. So this book uses trails. It is a guide to trails. And those trails are usually the bony landmarks of your body. And it's one of the ways that we um, study anatomy in this course, one of the main ways, really. And all muscles, essentially, at least all the muscles we're studying, 99.9% um, .9 of the muscles we're studying, attach to bones. So if you can find the bone, um, you can find the muscle. And so that's, that's the real reason. And the reason they're showing you different body types in this slide is finding that scapula on somebody who is very slender as opposed to somebody who has more layers of adipose tissue um, which adipose tissue is fat but we tend to use the term adipose tissue because our clients are not fat and our clients are not bony okay our clients are people and they just have different compositions but uh, one person in this in this slide has very little adipose tissue and so their bones are more prominent one person has more dense or thick layers of adipose tissue, and so their bones are less prominent. And that that adds um, a challenge to finding them, and finding the, the bones, and an even greater challenge to find the muscles. And so trails, trail guide, this entire book, and the ability to find the exact place on a bone um, is the whole secret to being able to then find the muscle and then work on the muscle, and then provide relief for your client. So it's all extremely key here. Um, the way your book l lays out each muscle is actually really neat. I really like it. So at the top of the page, you will see the name of the muscle. In the example they are using here, it is the sternal clidal mastoid. It's actually a muscle you're going to hear about a lot. We really care about it in massage quite a bit. But that's not the point right now. The point is you will see the name of the muscle at the top of the page. It is the sternal clidal mastoid. And then underneath here, uh, by the way, there's some nice verbiage on there that I highly recommend you read, but I'm, I'm highlighting key points right now. Underneath you see some letters and boxes. You see A-O-I-N. A stands for the action that the muscle can do, can perform. And muscles are actually what create movement in your body. And I like to put it this way. Muscles can only do one thing on their own power. And that is contract. That means they can only pull. They pull together. Now, can they ever unpull? Yes, gravity can pull them back apart. Another muscle can pull them back apart. They can just kind of fall apart. But they're not pushing themselves apart. They can only pull. They can only shorten. That's how they create movement. When a muscle is activated, it shortens. And when it shortens, an action is created. Movement is created. That's all they're saying. Now, they have very fancy names for actions, and you will learn those fancy names. They're as, as important, if not more important, than the muscles themselves. Uh, but to give you a very simple example, my bicep is essentially attached from, it's actually attached to my scapula, but it's attached to my shoulder up here, down into my forearm. When it shortens, it literally pulls, it contracts, it bends my elbow, and we call this bending a flexion. And so we would say the bicep actually creates a flexion of the elbow. Now, it can't unflex. It doesn't mean I can never straighten out my elbow again. It's that my bicep's not going to straighten it out. I have to use another muscle or gravity or something to throw it out. So it can lengthen again, but it's not really lengthening itself. Something else is pulling it out. It can only do one action, and that is to flex my elbow in this example. Your biceps can actually do a couple other kind of nifty things, but the point is they can only pull. So with this sternal collateral mastoid, which essentially goes from back here behind your ears down to your collarbone, basically, um, 
When it contracts, it actually pulls your head down, and we call that a flexion too, but we'd say this creates a flexion of the neck. So we'll get into more detail about that, why your book in this example has quite a few different actions it can do, because it depends on if just one side is working or the other side's working or both sides are working, all sorts of things. But the point is the A stands for action. That is extremely important, because if you don't know what muscles do, why learn them? That said, if you follow the way we teach anatomy, you won't have to memorize the actions. What you really need to memorize is the origins and insertions. And those are the next two boxes. The box with the O stands for origin. That's where the muscle starts. And the box with the I stands for insertion. That's where the muscle ends up. So the sternocleidomastoid starts here at the sternum and the clavicle, your collarbone, and goes up to something called the mastoid process, your temporal bone, but your skull for these purposes right now. Now, some of you might be wondering, well, why doesn't it go the other direction? And it does, right? I mean, I can drive from Phoenix to Flagstaff or Flagstaff to Phoenix on the same road. In general, we call the thing that doesn't move as much the origin and the thing that can move the insertion. They are both attachments. They are both end points for the muscle. You could switch them and you're going to get the same action. All right. If I know whether I'm going from Flagstaff to Phoenix or Phoenix to Flagstaff, I'm going to take I-17. So no matter which way I'm going to the sternocleidomastoid, when it contracts, these two parts come together. When I contract my sternocleidomastoid, these two parts come together. If you were holding my head, I theoretically could, it could lift up my collarbone to my head. But in general, my head's the part that moves. And in general, we call that part the insertion. We call this part down here the origin. But they are both just end point attachments for the muscles. In fact, sometimes you will hear me and other professionals just talk about muscle attachments. We'll say, hey, the two attachments for the sternocleidomastoid are, or the mastoid process, the temporal bone, and the sternum and clavicle down here. Because we don't really care so much. We know those two things come together to create an action. So let me give you a beautiful example of why I don't have to memorize the actions. Because I don't. But I do know the origin insertions. I know the origin and the insertion. I know the origin and the insertion for the sternocleidomastoid is right here and here. I know that if I pull my fingers together, that I will flex my head down. And if I want to get the other fancy stuff here where it says rotate, I know that if one side only flexes, I will actually get what's called a lateral flexion, where I kind of bend to the side and a rotation, because this has to come closer to this. So that's how you're getting all these different movements, and I don't have to memorize them. I can actually just kind of imagine those two points getting next to each other. That's what I recommend you do, but if you want to memorize all the actions, you go right ahead. The last box is N. N stands for nervation. And nervation is the wire from your spine that tells the muscle to move. So, in a very real sense, um, you have wires coming from your brain to every part of your body. And uh, these are living wires, and we call them nerves, and they're made with tissue and uh, connective tissue mostly. Um, but they really are wires. They really do carry electrical impulses, and they really do tell muscles to fire. They actually send a signal down through your brain, and it goes down to my bicep in this case, or my sternocleidomastoid, and, it's, and it tells some of the muscle fibers to contract. And we will get into the exact specifics of that in other chapters, but the fact is it really does send a signal that zaps it, and it it creates a chemical reaction and uh, and it creates a contraction. Um, the reason nervation is important is that these wires come out of different places in your spine. And if I'm having a problem with my sternocleidomastoid, it could be a problem with my sternocleidomastoid, but it could be a problem with the wire coming out of my spine. And you don't know which quite often, so you usually just work on both. 
Um, this is why we care a lot about back and neck tension because, and this is why chiropractors, by the way, are so into back alignment because they care about all the nerves coming out from the spine. And by the way, the spine is just a big bundle of wires too, really, that branches off to feed your entire body everywhere, everywhere. Millions and millions and millions of these wires. They're not only telling your muscles to fire, but they're also giving you sensations so you can feel the tips of your finger. In order for me to do this, I actually have to have a nerve here picking up this sensation millions of nerves, by the way, picking up the sensation, sending a signal back up my arm, going into my neck, and then up to my brain. Um, and so nervation is a good thing to know because uh, it gives you an idea of where to look. If somebody has some numbness or weakness in their arm, You, they might have an arm problem, but they also might have a neck problem. That's, that's not unusual. They might have some other problems too, by the way, but, but that's just to oversimplify things right now. I am lazy. I don't like memorizing nervations either um, because I'm not a neuroscientist and I don't actually have to get it down to the exact area. But I do want to know, like, if you're having a problem in your arm, where does that nerve probably exist that I should also check that place out in your spine? And your body's laid out in a really neat, logical fashion. And essentially, all the nerves that feed my arm come out of my neck. So when people come to me with arm problems, I work on their arms, but I also work on their neck. Essentially, all the stuff that comes out of what we call the thoracic region, our ribs and our abdominals and stuff, come from that part of our back, the thoracic region, the rib region of our back. So if somebody's having some pain, tightness, numbness, and it, by the way, some of this could be a heart attack, but, but the point is in a very simplified way, if somebody's having pain, tightness, numbness, ineffective muscles here, I would look at their back as well. Now, please don't run out of the classroom and every time somebody's finger hurts, say it's not your finger, it's your neck. Because that's not the case. We don't know. Right? So, if I call you on your cell phone and say fire, you don't know if I'm actually talking about a fire at my house or at your house. And it could be either one. Sometimes it's both, by the way. Sometimes there's problems all the way along. Sometimes a pinched nerve up in the neck creates some problems down here too. And you might as well work it all anyway. Nerves in the lower back actually reach around and go down the front of your legs and nerves down in your, your sacrum go down the back of your legs. And so without memorizing every last little nervation, it's very quick for me to say, oh, you seem to be having, you know, pain and soreness in the front of your thigh. I'm going to work that, but I'm also going to take a look at your low back. There's just five lumbar there. I'm going to take a look at that. Oh, you're having pain down the back of your leg, or you you're feel like you're losing function with some of the stuff in the back of your leg. That, that could be a pinched nerve in your sacrum. So we will, again, get into much deeper depth with that, with that and show you pictures and all this kind of stuff. But it's a real easy-peasy way that you don't have to memorize um, nervations. Um, and I'm not against memorizing stuff, but I, I, I want to focus on what's most important. And that's that you understand concepts. If you remember, you know, the, the spinal, you know, accessory uh, number 11 nerve and C2 and C3 for the stenocleidal mastoid, and you don't know what that means, then that's kind of useless. I want you to understand that there is a brain on top of your head and literally a bundle of wires that is your spinal cord, and those wires peel off as they go down and feed every section of your body. And, and when you have a problem, it could be a pinching anywhere along that wire up back up to your head or have nothing to do with the wires. So I am very much a big believer in you conceptually understanding concepts instead of memorizing them. And the same thing is true with actions. The same thing is true with actions. I don't want you to just say sternocleidal mastoid flexes the cervical vertebrae. Because I think you kind of forget to kind of visualize it and think about it. And then think about problems it could have and how it could rotate if it's working unilaterally or just one side or bilaterally, how it has to flex because they'd be kind of fighting each other. And it, it makes it hard for you to start to conceptualize much more complex kinesiology. Because when we get more advanced in the class, we're going to find that muscles rarely act on their own. So we're going to talk about the sternocleidal mastoid and the different things it can do on its own, but it doesn't do those things on its own. In fact, the fact that it can rotate at times, flex over here at times, 
means that other muscles have to stop it from doing one of those movements or the other to get the desired movement out of it. So they rarely act on their own. Okay. So what I really want you to focus on on these uh, on these muscles is the name uh, at the top, sternocleidomastoid, and there is an abbreviation for it called the SCM. Please don't use that in class, not because it's not wonderful. It, you will, it'll be the only thing you hear once you graduate. But before you graduate, I want you to remember that SCM stands for sternocleidomastoid. It's important. Then you can easily fall into the abbreviations once you graduate. I want you to really know the muscular name. Really remember this picture of where it is in the body. I really want you to think like you hear sternocleidomastoid. I want you to kind of go like this, right? Um, I like the verbiage they have underneath the muscles because it helps to give you some thoughts about them. There's often interesting facts, things like that, and then focus on the origin insertion. And this is going to sound weird. I don't care in what order you, you know those. I don't even care if you know the origin is the origin and the insertion is the insertion. I want you to know the two attachments because the two attachments are what give you movement. I don't care which one you call origin, which one you call insertion. If I made trail to guide the body, I'd probably call them all attachments because that's what they are. But know the name, know the O's and I's. You're going to hear that all the time. Name, O's, and I's. Palpating. Um, palpating means to explore. And we actually have a very tough job in massage therapy. We are exploring people through their tissue. And it's like exploring somebody with a blanket over them, although it's usually like exploring somebody with like three sheets and a blanket because there's all these layers to your tissue. And some people's tissue is hard and some people's tissue is soft and some people's tissue is extra hydrated and some is extra dry and some is extra stretchy and some seems to have very little resist I mean it has lots of resistance to it and so you're feeling it through different blankets all the time too and it's actually very hard to do so palpation just means um exploring and we're going to be talking about it all the time you're going to be doing it for the rest of your life you're palpating and usually you're searching for a bone once again so that you can then palpate to find the muscle you will be palpating for muscles but we're usually finding um, the bone. And quite often, somebody will put one hand over the other, and the top hand kind of provides the power, the movement, the depth, and the bottom hand actually just is there to sense what it's feeling. So the top hand provides the action, the bottom hand is there to sense what it's feeling. This is what your book recommends, and actually it's a very good recommendation. Um, As you get more and more into massage, you're going to realize that angles are everything. So, it is a lot different for me to push on my hand at this angle than it is on this angle. The same amount of force given like this feels much softer than this. And this is just a matter of angles. And angles are a matter of where I want to go to and how much pressure I want to apply. So we'll get into that more, but we just want you to start thinking angles are very important. Rolling and strumming is something that we don't normally do in massage, um, except to find a muscle. So sometimes it's easy to go, I've got muscles running down my forearm like this. Sometimes it's much easier to find them if you stroll and strum and roll across them because you feel yourself plucking across them. The reason we don't do that in a lot of massage is it's kind of annoying. We tend to, we tend to go with the grain. We tend to rub in general there are times we don't but in general with the grain but when i'm trying to find something i might strum across it back and forth and be like oh there it is i can feel it popping underneath my hand and then of course we play with movement and stillness where i'm just very still trying to find something and then moving a little bit to find it The other little trick we'll use, and I love, love, love this trick because I use it in my regular massage, not just to find stuff, but to actually massage, is to put movement into one hand while keeping the other hand still. So I can put a hand up here and rub this arm back and forth, but I can keep this hand still and have another hand move my arm, and that actually moves the arm underneath my hand. So I can move a person's body part underneath my hand, or I can move the hand. I like quite often moving their body part underneath my hand. Um, it's a way that I can kind of feel for movement in there, kind of find where I'm going. It's a great way to find things, but it's also a really 
great way to massage. And it's essentially something we call pin and stretching, where you're pinning something down and then moving it around. And you're going to hear us refer to it many, many times. It's a great way to find stuff. If you're trying to find what moves the elbow, hold stuff here and move the elbow. And then you're going to feel stuff move and you're going to be like, oh, that must be the stuff that, you know, affects the elbow. So it's a, it's a brilliant way to go. Brilliant. Um, we will be talking in depth later about passive and active movements because it comes into stretching. Um, and it comes into assessing where a client is at. But passive movements are when the client is not helping you. You are lifting their arm for them. Active movements are they are helping. Sometimes they're working against you even because you want them to. Uh, sometimes they're working against you because you don't want them to. But the point is, passive and active refer to the client, not you. You're always active. The massage therapist is always active. That's why you get paid to do this. It's a lot of work. But the client has passive movements and and active movements. And I'll give you some examples of why that's important. Um, if I can't actively lift my shoulder out here, that might mean I'm just not able to fire the muscles that move my shoulder. Especially if you, the therapist, can take my shoulder and you can move it out there, right? So you can passively move my shoulder. It works just fine. That tells us the shoulder joint's working just fine. I can't move it, which tells us there's probably some nerve muscular problem there, neuromuscular problem probably. Um, that's the type of stuff that we might use active and passive for. We also use it in some advanced stretching that I'm very excited for you guys to learn about. But again, not today. Coming attractions. Uh, we recommend, so does this book, but I strongly recommend that you keep a, a daily journal. Um, you have a a hundred and, you know, 14 days left in this course. And if you dedicated one page to each of those days and wrote down things that you learned, practical things like, okay, I learned about the sternocleidomastoid and the origins and insertions and what it could do, great. But also stuff like, um, I learned that when I'm working on a client with lots of hair, that if I put a layer of lotion on them first and then oil on top of them, it actually helps me glide on them better. So you're going to learn things that just aren't in books here. Um, and you might even want to be learning stuff about yourself and putting that in your journal. It makes a really neat diary at the end so that this time has been really well spent. I mean, this isn't my time, it's your time. And so I hope you'll consider journaling uh, that journey. I've, I've seen some students' journals that were just amazing. And I don't mean amazing so much academically, um, although they had all that information there too. But they just... You know, they had 120 really neat things that they wanted to retain, and and learning is retaining. So I, I, I think people get mistaken, and they think that when I tell you something, like I'm talking to you right now, that you are learning. You are not learning right now. I wish it was that easy. If you were learning right now, we could teach you everything in a couple of weeks. But our goal is to get you to retain what we've told you. So a lot of times you come in and you're like, can't we learn more about this? And can't we learn more about that? And can't we go on and on and on? And and the answer would normally be yes if, if the majority of the class had actually retained that information. But what we find is that people think hearing and being exposed to something is learning. And that's not. If you can't pull that information back out a month later out of your head, understand it and utilize it, you haven't learned it. You've been exposed to it, but you haven't learned it, right? I watch people play musical instruments. I've watched people talk about how to play musical instruments. I can't play a musical instrument. So learning is retaining, and your journal could really help you retain um, some really neat stuff about massage therapy. You know, at least hopefully the top 120 things every massage therapist should know, or at least you should know, and also maybe... Maybe some of the stuff that you've gained along the way. A lot of our students will actually write down what they said they were grateful for every day in their journal, and we'll kind of watch the progression of that too, um, because your your understanding of anatomy is not the only thing that's going to grow over the next eight months here. We will not be checking journals, though. By the way, that's your choice. You're adults. Um, so. 
Does anybody know what the largest organ in the body is? It's your skin. Your skin is considered an organ. It's huge, and we get to touch it directly. And it has many, many layers, but we tend to only think of it um, in terms of the three main layers, which is the layer that you can actually touch, the epidermis, um, the dermis underneath, um, and then the, there's a there's which you don't touch, by the way, but you might have seen when you cut yourself. And then underneath that is something called the hypodermis, and hypo actually means underneath. So you've got the epidermis, and epi means on top of or outer. Epidermis, dermis, hypodermis. Um, the epidermis does have multiple layers to it, and it's because of how skin grows, and we will do an entire chapter on skin. So I don't want to get into it right now, but I would like you to remember the three main layers. I just want you to also realize if somebody else is like, there aren't just three layers of the skin, there's seven or whatever. Yes, there are, right, because they're subdividing these three main layers. But you have an epidermis that you touch, a dermis that's the really alive part of your skin, by the way. Some of this epidermis up on top is dead, um, and you want it to be. Uh, and and the hypodermis, the underneath skin. So you've got the skin on top, epi on top, dermis. You've got the dermis, and then you've got the hypodermis. The hypodermis has two other names. Subcutaneous, which uh, underneath as well, right? Hypo means under, and sub means under. Submarine under the water, subcutaneous, and superficial fascia. Now, here's a very important thing to remember. Anytime Tapscott says anything about fascia, it's important. Um, super means above. And so it's weird that, that they're using the word above for the bottom layer of your skin, but there's a reason. Your body is wrapped in sheets of fascia. And we have not gotten into fascia yet, but it is the skin underneath your skin. And if you've ever, um, if you've ever prepared chicken and you pulled off that thin layer on top, it's like see through like saran wrap, but it's pretty tough. That's fascia. What a lot of people don't realize is, they don't even realize that's fascia, but that's fine. But every single layer underneath there has fascia on it. So when you boil chicken and it shreds in those long hairs, the reason it's shredding there is each little muscle fiber is wrapped in fascia. Like little electrical wires wrapped in plastic. And so you have layers upon layers upon layers of fascia. And since that's around all my muscles, the uppermost layer on top of all my muscles, because there's all this fascia around the muscle fibers and fascia around those things and fascia around the whole muscle and then fascia up here, the uppermost layer of fascia, the superficial fascia, is the bottom layer of skin. Because it kind of goes muscle with all this fascia on it. We're not going to get that right now. Superficial fascia, dermis, epidermis. So I prefer remembering that there's fascia there because it's extremely important to massage therapists because it's part of the way you're connected together. It's one of the main ways you're connected together, and we will study that quite a bit. So I like to think of epidermis, dermis, superficial fascia. But superficial fascia is hypodermis, subcutaneous. They're the same. Muscles! Muscles can only do one thing. What? Contract. Shorten. That's it. They pull. Now, one thing you want to ask yourself is, if muscles only pull, how can I do a push-up? Hmm. I'm not going to answer that for you right now, but you will be able to answer that question here. Um, muscles can only do one thing, pull or contract. It's the only power they exert. And so the question is, how do you push? Um, but we give certain names to muscles when they do certain actions. And the muscle that's moving we call the prime mover, or the agonist. Now, don't get confused. My biceps aren't always prime movers or agonists. But when I'm doing a curl and they're contracting, I'm in agony. My biceps are in agony and they are called a prime mover or an agonist. Now, I have triceps in the back, by the way, that do the opposite and will actually pull my arm out. They're considered an antagonist when I'm pulling this way. 
They are the thing that can antagonize my biceps and stop this movement. But if I push out, push out like this, well, that's my triceps doing that. And the minute I start pushing out, my triceps become the agonist or the prime mover and my biceps become the antagonist. So biceps and triceps aren't agonists or antagonists. It depends on what the movement is. The muscle producing the movement and creating agony while you're lifting is the prime mover, the agonist. The one that is stopping it, when somebody's antagonizing you, they're stopping you from doing what you want to do. Um, the one that could stop the movement, usually on the opposite side, is the antagonist. But the minute that movement changes, they could switch roles. Very important to remember, though. Prime mover is an agonist. You can use those interchangeably. And the antagonist is the muscle that can stop the movement. Believe it or not, in massage, we're usually more concerned with antagonists. Uh, we're concerned with muscles that are, that are stopping wanted movements. Where somebody's like, I feel stiff. I'm having a hard time moving my neck. Well, I care about the stuff that's stopping the movement. You're able to move your neck. You're able to pull it. The agonist is able to pull, but the antagonist seems to be making it hard for you to do so. And so we often care about antagonists. What is holding you back, right? Um, by the way, the muscles we're going to be studying are skeletal muscles. That just means they attach to your skeleton. And the bones of your body are the levers of your body. And I, they need to have a muscle attached to them to pull them to create movement. And so we study skeletal muscles. There are other muscles in your body that we don't study. Um, a lot of internal muscles that are not attached to um, uh, bone. Um, that still contract and still uh, produce important functions, but they don't help you move directly um, in a kinesiology sense. But they are extremely important. Believe it or not, you've got muscle around all your blood vessels um, that allow you to actually sh contract your blood vessels down and make them smaller if need be, which is really, really helpful. You've got adjustable tubing in your body, which is amazing. And, and that's in part due to the fact that you have muscles around all your blood vessels. Um, so they're all over the place, but we are going to be studying skeletal muscles because we care about movement. And, and your bones are the levers of your body and muscles attached to those levers. And they only do one thing, they pull, and that creates the levers to move. And that is kinesiology. Um, skeletal muscle is striated muscle. And that just means you can see these little lines in it, and that's these lines created, which we will get into when we study an entire chapter on muscles. Striations are just these little lines that you see in the muscle that are between the contractile units, because really these big muscles in your body have a whole bunch of little compartments that help them contract, and each compartment does its part, and each pull in their own little way, and then the, the cumulative effect is a whole muscle shortens. Beautiful picture of a biceps brachii right there. Um, they're showing you how they show cross sections in the book. And this actually is really fascinating because this is your arm bone. This is your humerus up here. And like, I don't have particularly big arms, but, but the bone in there is really small. And we forget that. The majority of the size of your body is made up by muscle and fat and connective tissue. Um, and so these cross sections kind of help you realize where, where you're pushing, what's going on. Um, in this in this arm. It just helps you to further locate these muscles. This book is trying to do something very tricky. And they do a good job, but nobody could do a perfect job. They're trying to teach you about three-dimensional anatomy in a two-dimensional space in a book. Just like what I'm trying to do right now. I'm showing you a picture of a bicep on a flat, uh, you know, slide. And, but your biceps aren't flat and they don't, they don't exist in a flat dimension. And so it is tricky. Uh, but this is one of the tools they use to help help you kind of figure out how things are lined up in the body and where stuff is located and all that good stuff. There are different types of muscle fibers. That means muscles, you know, it's not just one big contractile unit. Really, muscles have all sorts of tiny microscopic hair-like, but they're smaller in hair, contractile muscles. So my biceps are actually made up of like a million, and I honestly don't know the number, but it easily is a million, contractile muscles, baby muscles all bound together. Um, those fibers can run different directions, and you won't hear a lot of massage therapists talk about this because once you understand the concept, it's not really important. But the direction of the fibers can give you a clue as to what the muscles do. If the fibers are all running in the same direction, that's how it's going to contract. 
we do have what are called unipennant and bipennant muscles where the fibers kind of on both sides. And, and you don't have to memorize which muscles are bipennant or anything like that. But what's significant about that is a muscle where you've got bipennant there, it's almost like you've got two people pulling on that rope to pull that muscle. It's an area that needs a lot of strength. Um, another example of watching the way the fibers go is if you look at this sphincter muscle, which um, this one happens to be around an eye, but we have them around our mouth, and yes, we have them in our bottom. Uh, those muscles, those fibers run in a circle, and they help me to pull things together, to cinch together something, right? They actually will close the hole. Um, and so that's the only reason they, they bring this up, this, this, the, the muscle fibers and which direction they run. Again, you don't need to go around memorizing which muscles are bipennant or unipennant or, or, or triangular or whatever. I just want you aware of the concept that the fibers are running in a particular direction to create a particular movement. Tendon. Tendon is at the end of every muscle. Tendon attaches muscle to bone. Ligaments attach bone to bone. That is massage 101. That is anatomy 101. Please, 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 please don't ever forget. Tendons attach muscle to bone. Ligaments attach bone to bone. We have ligaments everywhere. In fact, you have more. If we had a course on just ligaments, it would take us forever to teach you because you have more ligaments than you do muscles. But the reason my shoulder doesn't just drop off my body is actually not because of the muscles, but because of the ligaments. Ligaments are like these tough rubber bands that tie my humerus to my scapula. And by the way, my entire body together, everywhere. Ligaments attach bone to bone and they give integrity to your joints and they're, they're everywhere, right? And they are look identical to tendons, actually, except there's not a muscle associated with them. And um, you have probably seen these at the, this type of tissue uh, when dealing with like chicken and things like that too. Um, but ligaments attach bone to bone to hold your body together. Tendons are at the end of muscles and they attach the muscle to the bone. They look identical when you just look at a ligament and just the end part of a muscle and the tendon. It's this white material. You've seen it on a chicken breast before, that little white, impossible to chew through material that was a tendon on a, on a chicken breast. Which, by the way, is a pectoralis major of a chicken. Um, but that's their purpose. They are connective tissue. They are meant to be extremely strong. And they are. They're much harder to tear than muscle. But because they're so strong... And so dense, they actually repair very slowly because they're so dense that blood doesn't get into them as well. So a lot of times in massage, we emphasize origins and insertions to help get extra blood into the endpoint tendons where the muscle is attached because there's, there's tendon at both the origin and the insertion. Later, we're going to learn that in a way, there's kind of tendon throughout the whole muscle, but I don't want to complicate things yet. Tendon attaches muscle to bone. Ligament attaches bone to bone. Don't ever, ever forget that. Uh, this picture of this foot is a great example of just all the little ligaments, and these aren't all of them, that help to hold a foot together. This isn't even the muscles on here yet. These are just the ligaments that give integrity to the foot. And there's just some of them. Um, this is a cross-section of an arm. So this is really gory, but I always have to get gory in anatomy. If we took a chainsaw and went shoomph and sawed through my arm this way and looked at it, you actually have two bones in your arm, a humerus and an ulna. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. A radius and an ulna. An ulna by my elbow, a radius going to my thumb. <laughs> and that's a radius and an ulna in my forearm. And this is a picture of them. And they're just trying to teach you about different things that you would see in there. Um, you've got um, aponeuroses, which is sheet-like fascia that's, that's wrapped around here. Uh, retinaculum which is ribbon-like fascia. Um, oh, sorry. Let me back up here for a second. That's not... I'm sorry, I didn't look at the slide very carefully, and I apologize. Um, they're just showing you a cross-section here. Aponeuroses, retinaculum, ligaments, and tendons are all types of fascia. And 
I have them listed here. This was not part of the slide originally. I put them in here because I wanted to explain to you the different types of fascia. So fascia is all connective tissue. It's everywhere. I told you about the layers. It's the skin on the skin. Well, if you take, this is a poor example, but we're going to do it. I wish I had saran wrap, but let's pretend this is fascia. A big sheet-like fascia is aponeuroses. It's like this. Well, if you take that sheet and you make it a little thicker, but it's still long, you've now got ribbon-like fascia. You often see it, it's called retinaculum, and you often see it wrapped around wrists underneath people's skin. You never see it on top of the skin. This is your skin under your skin. Um, but it's meant to support your wrists. It's the exact same thing gymnasts do where they wrap their wrists. This is retinaculum, and it's still fascia, right? We just folded it up. Ligaments and tendons tend to look like all this in rope fashion. And you can see how strong it gets, right? This was just a sheet of paper. But when you wrap it up and you've got all those layers, stuff like that, it's really quite strong. If this was attached between two bones, it would be a ligament. If it was attached from a muscle to a bone, it would be a tendon. Those are the four types of fascia. Um, what this slide was showing you that I completely ignored in the beginning um, is about different fascia that's found inside here. There is fascia actually around your bones called periosteum. And we will study bones and study that as well. The periosteum actually helps to feed nutrients to the bone and helps your tendon attach to your bone. So really, your muscular tendon, which is fascia, weaves into periosteum, which is fascia, to hold onto the bone. Um, again, it's all fascia. Um, um, interosseous membrane is fascia between bones. Deep fascia is fascia that's below the superficial fascia. Um, they're just showing you all this stuff. You can see the superficial fascia in this slide, which is underneath the skin, right? It's the bottom layer of skin but the top layer of fascia, and this beautiful adipose tissue. And I do say beautiful because adipose tissue has gotten a, a bad rap. And yes, you don't want a couple extra hundred pounds of the stuff, um, but it's really, really important. It um, conserves um, heat for your body. It stores energy. It stores uh, hormones in your body. It helps with hormone regulation, um, and it prevents shock to your body. It actually prevents, it provides cushioning to your body, and, and you're meant to have it. So this just talks about exploring some of this, this fascia. Here's retinaculum wrapped around the ankle um, and playing with the skin underneath the skin. And we will do some uh, fascial work in, in this class. Um, you might have heard of myofascial work, which just means muscular fascial work. Um, as far as I'm concerned, all massage should essentially be myofascial work. Um, I don't really like to separate the two. Um, you're going to do an entire section on the circulatory system. But for now, circulatory system, by the way, is your heart. It pumps blood to and from the rest of your body. Blood is life. Blood is life. Blood is life. It's the food and the oxygen that your whole body needs, all your cells need, and it gets rid of the waste products that they, they get rid of afterwards, CO2 and other products. Arteries tend to be red and go away from the heart. They're red because they're full of oxygen. Um, there is one situation that's not true, but that's not important right now. They are red. They're under a lot of pressure because your heart just pumped, and they're pumping out to the rest of the body, and that is arteries. Veins tend to look blue because they are depleted of oxygen, and your blood actually changes color when you deplete it of oxygen. The reason you've never seen blue blood outside your body is the minute you cut yourself, it's exposed to oxygen, and it turns red. Um, veins are blue. They have less pressure, and they're coming back. This is, this is why if you get cut, you don't want to cut an artery, you prefer to cut a vein. Arteries are the things in the horror movies that go psh, psh, psh. They're under a lot of pressure. But arteries, red, go away from the heart. Veins carry blue blood, go back to heart. Arteries and veins are essentially the same, by the way. They're just tubing. But we label the tubing that goes away from the heart, arteries, and the tubing going to the heart veins. And that's just an important one-on-one -on -one basic anatomy fact. We're going to get much deeper into that when you get into the cardiovascular system. Uh, bursi. Uh, you ever heard of bursitis? Bursi are lubricating sacs that are found around joints. Um, 
you might ask yourself, why would I need lubricating sacs around joints, not in joints? We definitely need lubrication in joints, and most of the joints we're going to study are called synovial joints, and they actually have a sac around them, and they're filled with stuff called synovial fluid, and it really is like an oil, um, and it's true in your knuckles and everywhere. And um, yes, that is that is lubricating stuff in your joints. But remember those tendons I told you about, ligaments? They roll over the top or the outsides of your joints, and sometimes they can rub on things. And having little bursae sacs in there can help them not rub. But if sometimes they rub those sacs so much you get bursitis, which is inflammation of the bursae sac. By the way, itis means inflammation. Tendonitis, inflammation of the tendon. Ligamentitis, inflammation of the um, ligament. Bursitis, information uh, inflammation um of the bursae sac um tapscotitis you've you've upset me okay nerves just remember when nerves get compressed remember when nerves feed everything in our body um doesn't mean if i have a pain in my finger that the problem's in the neck but it could be a compressed nerve in the neck um when you pinch on nerves you you create pain and quite often it's referred pain can be pain right there, but quite often it sends a ghost signal down the line, and so you can get you can get referred pain as well. Um, so pain is not always the problem. Pain is quite often a symptom of another problem. And really good massage therapists don't just treat um, symptoms, um, which most massage therapists aren't really good massage therapists. So they treat symptoms, and that works for a day or so. Uh, somebody comes to you with a sore neck, and you you rub it, it does feel better. There's no doubt about it. And that might be enough for that client. Then maybe they'll keep coming back to you. I don't know. But a really good massage therapist tries to figure out why that neck keeps hurting and tries to get to a more root problem so they can provide longer relief for this client. Um, your book's also showing you a picture of lymph nodes here. This is part of the lymphatic system. Lymphatic system could be part of the circulatory system could be part of your immune system. It depends on how you want to categorize stuff. These systems are just made up by us to understand the body. Um, lymph nodes, though, are tiny little filtering units that are meant to filter out debris and impossible bacteria and, you know, foreign things in your body um, before it gets back into your heart. And it's, it's definitely part of your immune system. It's also definitely part of your circulatory system. Anyway, the reason they're important is that you want to do want to be aware that there are lymph nodes around areas, um, mainly around the folds of your body, by the way. So where I bend, like my axillary region, which is my armpit, um, uh, even my stomach where I bend, there's lots of lymph nodes there. You've got them everywhere, but there's lots of lymph nodes there. And you just want to be aware, that, like if you feel a lump here, well, that could be an inflamed lymph node. You don't want to think that's a knot and start digging away on that thing. So that's that's why they point them out to you. Is, um, they are inhabited in what we call endangerment sites. So endangerment site is a site you don't want to work deeply on. You don't have to worry about touching it. You're not going to kill somebody. But I don't work deeply inside somebody's armpit. And it, just go ahead and push inside your armpit for a second. And you can tell it's the wrong thing to do. I can work deeply on the edges of what created my armpit. Because there's, there's not really a pit there. There's two mountains that created a valley. <laughs> the mountain up in front is my pectoralis major and back by the latissimus dorsi and a whole bunch of other stuff. But that's what created a seeming armpit in axillary region. So the muscle here you can go to town on, but inside here there's not a lot of protection for the lymph nodes and some arteries, veins, and nerves in there. And so we call it an endangerment site. And we want to be careful you don't go digging around in there. Again, you don't have to be scared, but don't go digging around in there. Um, you're going you're gonna to hurt people. Okay. Um, I don't think we need to go into learning objection uh, objectives. And the rest of this is muscular review, which your instructor, I'm sure, has done with you or will do to you. Uh, do to you. I love that because that's how I look at it. Um, or I will. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure making this video. Uh, I hope it was helpful, and I look forward to seeing you live.